Welcome everyone, thank you for coming to today's Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute here at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. The Hinckley seeks to foster public debate and civil discourse on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Just a quick note uh, that pizza will be available at the conclusion of today's event. Uh, so just look for that on your way out. Today's forum is titled Modern Lawfare, War and Video Games. We're excited to hear from Professor Sebastian Kempf. This event is sponsored by the Department of Political Science and is presented as part of the Wormuth Endowed Lecture Series. We'd like to thank Professor Brent Steele for his support in organizing this event. The Wormuth Endowment makes possible symposia, lectures, and initiatives that are the, at the intersection of international and American politics. Um, also a quick note that if you found today's conversation enlightening and fascinating and you want to learn more, there will be an event tonight at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts from 6 to 8 p.m. There will be some food available uh, for those who attend and a film screening and post screening conversation. So a great way to add on to what you've learned, what you're going to learn today. And now I'm going to turn it over to one of our student staff here at the Hinckley Institute, Ashton Pelly, to introduce Professor Kempf. Sebastian Kempf is an associate professor in peace and conflict studies at the School of Political Science and International Studies. His expertise lies in the intersection between international relations and peace and conflict studies with specialization in the areas of international security, ethics and the law of war, and, the informa and information technology relating to global politics and violent conflict. Specifically, his research focuses on two areas. The first concerns the relationship between ethics and the laws of war in the context of the transformation of violent conflict. Here, he is interested in the ways in which historic and contemporary wars, waged under conditions of asymmetry, have impacted the on the relationship between the norms of ca casualty aversion and civ civilian protection. The second area focuses on the role of transforming global media landscape is playing in violent conflict. Playing in violent conflict. Here, his research focuses on how historic and current conflicts are being waged and through media and information technology, with a particular emphasis on geopolitics of cyberspace, embedded news reporting, mass surveillance and big data mining, non-state armed groups, and the influence of the Pentagon and the CIA in the entertainment sector. Dr. Kemp received his PhD at the Department of International Politics at Aberystwyth University. He holds a BSc and an MSc in international relations from the London School of Economics. So please give a hand for Dr. Sebastian Kemp. Hi, welcome. Very nice to see you all here. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to be invited by Brent to come all the way from Australia over here. I spend uh, 19 hours on planes and airports yesterday. I feel at the surface to be like really energized, um, but you know how it is with jet lag. It might give me a very rapid nosedive into this. I'm hoping this appears, uh, occurs over lunch, but not uh, during my talk here. So very nice. It's my first time to Salt Lake City um, and absolutely stunning. And you know, I live in, even though I'm German originally, I live in tropical sunshiny Brisbane and I miss the snow. So I'm just stunned at the moment. Anyway, so you have that vista all the time, so maybe that's why you didn't have to look at it and came here to chat about modern lawfare. And I want to kick this off by asking you a few questions. Um, who of you actually have been watching war in the news? Who of you have been watching war in the movies? or through a screen. Who of you have been playing first-person shooter video games? Okay. And who of you have personally been in a war zone when war has been going on? Maybe as a refugee, an aid worker, or anyone? It's that discrepancy. Okay, one person here. But it's still that particular discrepancy um, that, or that distribution that I want to anchor my talk around. Um, our experience with war can be described by a physical distance and a virtual proximity. To us, of course, um, you know, meaning us here in the room or predominantly us here 
in Western societies. And I think there would be a very different distribution if we were asking the same kinds of questions to people in Gaza, in the Ukraine, uh, Mali, Yemen, just to mention a few. Okay, so the talk I will be giving here is anchored around four key points. The first one I just mentioned, that for changes in our societies and the way in which Western societies have been waging war, our experience with war has become one of physical distance and virtual proximity. We've become distanced from the risks and the cost, physical costs of war, but the average citizen in our society has never been virtually closer to the experience of war through the screens that we have around us. And first-person shooter video gaming is a very crucial component in this dynamic, functioning in a way as one of the principal means for which we tend to consume and importantly immersively interact with war for a large segment of our societies. And that intersection that's the third point I'm going to make, for the most part, is actually a very unhealthy one. Because, even though exceptions exist, military first-person shooters typically both reflect and sustain the so-called war is hell myth, a conviction that there's no rules in war and that instead um, the rules cannot and should not apply to the battlefield. And the fourth point I'm going to make is to say that um, or to argue that a more nuanced and uh, complete integration of the laws of war into the medium of first-person shooters would help increase public awareness of the influence, the benefits, but also the limits within um, the rules, well, like how war should be conducted, and at the same time would allow first-person shooter, shooter video game designers to really live up to their claim or their thrive towards a realistic and authentic depiction of battlefield experiences. That's my argument in a nutshell. Before I go in there, I quickly want to locate that kind of research within the existing literature. Um, as no doubt, through having been students to members of staff here uh, in your department, you have become aware and you're fully aware of is that there has been a large number of emerging scholarship on culture, popular culture in general, but also military-themed video games. Um, that have established that kind of focus as a serious form of analysis. And so what we got over the last decade or 15 years is a very methodologically diverse but conceptually critical and empirically rich body of research that has emerged on first-person shooter video games. One person to mention here, James Dadarian, has been probably one of the persons who produced a lot of the groundwork when he was talking about the military industrial media entertainment network. And he was someone who started introducing games, clarifying the degree to which first-person shooters were anchored in world politics, anchored in conflict, political economy, identity formation, and effect. And then we have a lot of further research that has emerged um, by various scholars, right, who have looked into representations in war and, uh, and video games, have looked at the influence of first-person shooters on modern military training, recruitment, mobilization of public support. Others have looked at the significant involvement of military actors in the production of those games or the centrality of the interactive dimension of first-person shooters for audience immersion, reception, and identity formation. So a lot of really interesting stuff that has been done that's really valuable. Missing from this analysis, however, is an evaluation of the impact of this medium on how the public understands or perhaps misunderstands the role of international humanitarian law in battle and the role of battlefield rule compliance. And that was, in a way, the motivation that we had, and we is not the royal we, um, I should have clarified that from off the beginning. One of my former PhD students who is now a lecturer at the University of Copenhagen, Neil Rennick, and I have been working on this together and published a piece on that. But that was part of our motivation was to demonstrate how the immersive nature of these games actively and quite problematically shapes public opinion on war through the so-called war is hell myth or the war is hell narrative. So, 
First point of the argument, the relationship between Western citizens and war is characterized by physical distance and virtual proximity. And there's a number of factors that have led us to this particular point, including famously, of course, in most Western societies, the termination of conscription and the rise of professionalized armed forces. That strips the vast majority of the population away already from the physical experience of war. Then we've got the development of you know, technologically sophisticated extended range weapon systems, and by and large, also the absence of our society's involvement in great power wars. And that development um, has been commented on by people for a long time. So already in 1988, um, it was Michael Mann who called this phenomenon of Western war spectator sport war. In a type of war in which for um, all but an ever diminishing portion of active combatants, war had transformed from a participatory activity to an observational one, right? And that's something that from the 19, late 1980s onwards has been a trend that has intensified through what then became known as the revolution in military affairs, subsequently net-centric warfare, the investment in modes of war that mitigate the need for public sacrifice. So, you know, for example, um, the replacement of humans through drones and robots, the increasing use of um, surrogate indigenous forces instead of using your own ground forces, and so on and so forth. Right? Western, as Western citizens, we have become divorced from key physical aspects of war itself. The crux is that despite this physical distancing, our virtual engagement with war has been historically unprecedented. And obviously that has to do with the change in the global media sphere, starting with the development of satellite television, obviously the internet, the mobile phone, which now offer us an access to the virtual aspect of war that is real-time, interactive, multifaceted, even invitational. And arguably no medium encapsulates this shift as starkly as military first-person shooters. And these first-person shooters re-engage Western audiences as participants in war, but through a very in a very different fashion. And they turn us from mere citizen spectators into active virtual citizen soldiers. So our relationship with war is a primary, primarily a virtual one. We immerse, but we do not experience. We interact, but we do not know. And it's this disconnect that it's most striking in the relations to the rules of war and standards of the battlefield, and in particular, it is most striking with regards to the endurance of the so-called war is hell myth. So what is the war is hell myth? For those who had to, for, were forced to study Latin in school like I had, the term inter arma silent legis rings a bell. In times of war, the law is silent. And that phrase offers a classical realist depiction of war. And according to this perspective, war is fundamentally and immutably amoral. It's a domain within which the rules of good conduct cannot and importantly should not apply. It's the argument that war is hell and therefore anything goes. Now fortunately, that's not always been, never entirely been the case for as long as war has existed, the reach and the limits of violence have been regulated. First through ethical or moral codes and more lately from the second half of the 19th century onwards through legal codifications uh, in the form of say the, the Hague Conventions or the Geneva Conventions. The good news is that Western militaries have over the last couple of decades worked quite hard to largely bring their warfare into greater alignment with the laws of war, both doctrinally and also technologically. Western militaries and policymakers have largely, and in particular compared to their own past, accepted and internalized the notion that war is a rules-based domain. 
Now, having said this, I also immediately need to qualify this in two particular ways. Um, Western warfare, and that's the first point, Western warfare often continues to deviate from the laws of war in quite unacceptable degrees. And even when it is legally compliant, it generates a host of moral concerns and questions. And the second point, even more problematically here, is that the war is hell narrative continues to resonate very strongly with the public and amongst policymakers. So despite all these developments and quite interesting positive developments with militaries coming to more and more comply with the laws of war, the war's helmet proves to be very, very strong. And I want to give you just a couple of examples, and there's more in the article that Neil and I have written about this. So first example of the persistence of the war's helmet President Trump pardoned the number of individuals who were convicted of war crimes, including murder, on the basis that they, quote, have to be able to fight, unquote. And the laws of war, he was implying, provide an obstacle for soldiers doing what they need to do. Go back further in time, right? Go to the convict time of the conviction of Lieutenant William Kelly, who during the uh, My Lai massacre in 1968 in Vietnam was convicted of having personally killed 22 Vietnamese civilians. Subsequently, after his trial and his conviction, there were thousands of telegrams sent to the White House. And the percentage of US citizens urging clemency for Kelly outnumbered those opposing it by a factor of 100 to 1, arguing that you cannot blame a soldier for violating laws because war is hell. I'll give you a third, more contemporary example, again, or examples. In 2011, the American Red Cross surveyed US citizens and found that 51% of respondents agreed that it was acceptable to torture an enemy combatant in order to extract information. Similarly, um, a more recent survey revealed a willingness amongst the US public to overlook misconduct in war when it is conducted by, quote, just combatants. So here we see the persistence or endurance of the war is hell myth, and there's more examples, right? Now, we can possibly understand the persistence of this war's hell myth as resulting from a top-down process, right? Where, like, leaders in the military and in politics will express these sorts of things and will influence the public about this. So the sense that policymakers perpetuate these narratives about war, downplay that, um, and thereby rather downplay then elevate the status of battlefield rules. But at the same time, we shouldn't ignore the sociocultural factors that are also at work. Yes, politicians guide, but also respond, having to modify their rhetoric and policy in reflection of the kinds of views they get from the electorate. And so public sentiment exerts particular influence in liberal democratic war, where it can also serve as a means to constrain, to tame, um, or alternatively excuse or forgive uh, state misconduct. And that brings me to first-person shooter video games, and in particular, the role that they play in reflecting, sustaining, and oftentimes explicitly promoting the war is hell myth among the general public. And I have to say a few things about the video gaming industry in the first place, because that's really interesting. That's an industry that has grown exponentially since the 1990s. Today, there's over an estimated over 1 billion players worldwide. And in 2022, that industry has generated over 140 billion US dollars. I'm mentioning this because that is a market share that is nearly double that of the global movie industry. And it is not unusual, rather it is very common, that first-person shooters now routinely outperform the highest grossing cinema titles every year. And that started from 2011 onwards, when we had Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 easily outperforming the latest Harry Potter film that was the highest grossing movie of that particular year. And those figures, I think, highlight the degree to which war-themed video games 
have supplanted other forms of popular culture as the predominant form of mass entertainment. And in doing so, have become one of the most, maybe the primary or one of the primary means for which we as citizens experience warfare. And experience, I put this in quotation marks, I think it must be stressed, that experience is primarily a Western phenomenon, a Western one. The political economy of first-person shooter production, distribution, circulation, and consumption is he heavily and very unevenly tilted towards a Western consumer audience. It's really striking, which means that Western voices are producing games about war that are overwhelmingly played by Western players. Robinson does some really fascinating research on this. And these players typically is, are physically divorced from actual war by virtue, of course, of the changes of Western military practices. And while being virtually engaged at the same time to an unprecedented degree. And the immersion offered by these games often extends to current and ongoing Western military campaigns. So we had a trend for a long time with first-person shooter video game producers who basically tried to be able to release new games as closely to actual war fighting events. So that, for example, um, you could play the war on terror already a year in Afghanistan, already a year after the beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom. By the time of the Iraq war in 2003, the earliest producer released um, invasion, um, uh, Iraqi, Operation Iraqi Freedom as a first-person shooter game three and a half months after the beginning of that operation. Okay? So that's, you know, we see like how it's tightly con uh, linked to the developments of real war, but of course we also see very popular first-person shooters for the Second World War and, you know, more historical campaigns as well. And what we have with this is an industry that argues that what they're seeking to do is to inject realism, authenticity, and accuracy into these games. And quite often they've benefited from the direct involvement of Western militaries as advisors or even further um, involvement in the design process of these games. Sometimes we have militaries directly producing their own games. America's army, of course, is one of the prime examples here. Now, critics and audiences alike have very often praised these recent title, titles for their immersive environment and for the visceral combat. And crucially, though, they shouldn't mistake this for realism. In fact, more often than not, these military first-person shooters have a distortive impact on public understandings of war, in particular to the extent to which war is a rule-governed affair. So, for instance, in most of these games, there are no civilians. And those of you who have played those games would have experienced this. No civilians there. Which is really at odds, right? Because since the 1990s, the predominant number of conflicts year in, year out have been waged in densely urbanized environments, where by definitions, civilians will be there. Gaza is only the latest good example of that. Okay? So, here are the games that either downplay or disregard key elements of the laws of war. Sometimes in these games, players may directly target civilians where they might occur. They can also quite often torture prisoners of war, kill them. They can attack neutral humanitarian agencies and actors without penalty. Now, you might now say, well, so what, right? Um, the topic under discussion, after all, is only video games. But I would like to contest this. Um, while certainly virtual battlefields are devoid of physical risk and uh, sacrifice, they are not devoid of meaning. And like television and like cinema, video games are very important cultural and ethical devices that both reflect and configure values and discourses in our contemporary societies. And video games, on account of their interactivity, actually go beyond most of the other forms of entertainment that we have in that space, because they provide for a deeper type of experience. Because it's interactive gameplay, right, that research shows that plays a particularly effective device for conveying 
and reinforcing motivations and beliefs amongst players. And this reinforcement derives from the rules and processes that are coded into the game, which enable and disable players from undertaking certain types of actions. It matters, therefore, when these games and the rules that structure these games prime audiences to accept dangerous falsehood regarding armed conflict and the rules that restrain it. Now, this priming, we argue, can, can occur in two different ways with regards to the rules of war. Neil and I call this first-person shooters as either being rule-free or being anti-rule. I'll start with rule-free here, right? These are the games like you know, Battlefield, Bad Company, Far Cry 2, or Soldiers of Fortune, I could mention more. Right? These games fail to integrate the laws of war into their gameplay in any kind of meaningful way. That means that players can rape and pillage and destroy civilian, civilians and property without any consequence, and importantly, without any reference to the existing battlefield rules. They can injure and kill enemy combatants, even those entitled to prison of war status, by virtue of their defensiveness. Defensive, de defenselessness, here we go. Um, so these are games that are not really, that are non-instructive, because they're giving a false impression that the rules of war simply do not exist. The second group, anti-rule, right? These games integrate the rules of war, the laws of war, into the gameplay, into the storyline, but they do so by distorting the role that they actually play and by distorting their fundamental status. They inform the players of the existence of rule-structured battlefields, but frame these rules as obstacles that players actually need to overcome to progress further in the gameplay itself. Good examples here are uh, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, released in 2009, right, where players participate in an airport massacre. Um, or take Modern Warfare, released in 2019, where players are made aware of existing laws, but in order to progress in the gameplay and to win, they have to violate them. And here the rules function less as a guide for appropriate conduct than as a roadblock to doing what is right or doing what is necessary. The guardian of the Geneva Convention, the International Committee of the Red Cross, became alerted to these games. And from 2011 onwards started their own research into this particular field. And what their research has shown is that first-person shooters more often than not promote an image of war in which the rules are either ignored or simply denigrated with impunity. That in other words, what this research shows is that these games normalize battlefield misconduct and thereby continue to promote the war is hell myth. And so the, the problem we see and the question that we need to ask is over the extent to which we need to find ways to integrate the laws of war into these games in a meaningful way. Can the laws of war be meaningfully integrated into first-person shooters? And the ICRC has tried to do this. They have tried to collaborate with first-person shooter game producers, but without much success. There was no interest in collaborating with them. And of course, one could argue that for some, um, or you know, one way that uh, could be done for game developers would obviously simply to avoid producing scenarios that could easily lead to the violations of the laws of war. But of course, that would not be an accurate depiction of battlefield reality. And more importantly, it is oftentimes, oftentimes very difficult to judge whether military action under certain circumstances is legal or illegal, whether it is moral or immoral behavior, especially in the heat of battle. But that should be precisely the type of crux and issue and dilemma that should be built into these games, because that would make them really realistic to what it is that soldiers actually face. 
And the consequences, of course, for, mis for misbehavior or violation could include explicit coercive measures. You know, one reason, as the research shows us, one reason as to why soldiers follow rules is their fear over punishment. So instilling that into first-person shooters would you know, be to include reference to enforcement mechanisms that actually exist with every professional armed forces uh, by to various degrees. So in-game penalties should be imposed upon players who violate the rules or perhaps even create something like mission termination following more egregious misconducts. First-person shooters could also do a better job at clarifying the importance of rule compliance for the legitimacy of military operations. Quite often, the war is hell myth is, hell myth is being invoked to convince populations, audiences, uh, to the idea that laws of war provide obstacles that hinder us from winning, that they constrain us in unnecessary ways, um, and delay us winning or perhaps preventing us from winning altogether. This, of course, is illogical, as every research has shown, in particular research on contemporary counterinsurgency measures. And even the American military, which had to learn this the hard way in Afghanistan and Iraq, changed its own rules, famously in 2017 and onwards, right, where they basically were arguing that compliance with the rules i.e. protection of civilians and innocents, is the most crucial factor that will en enable us to win. And I've put this quote here, right, where they say, civilian casualty mitigation directly affects the success of the overall mission. Minimizing and addressing civilian casualty incidents support strategic imperatives and are also at the heart of the profession at arms. Right? And the there's another reason why we should include um, rule compliance into first-person shooters, and that has to do with virtue, in particular, virtue ethics. The good conduct that is a necessary component of good moral character. It's something that militaries would be all too familiar with, the warrior ethic. The idea that doing the right thing starts with um, becoming an ethical agent observing the laws, doing the right thing. So the warrior status is best understood as a kind of moral and psychological armor that pro uh, protects the combatant from becoming a monster in his or her own eyes. And of course, the kind of warrior status and so on has evolved and modernized. But in doing that, it has placed increasing emphasis on restraint, on professionalism, rule compliance, and so on. And research has found that the warrior ethos, ethos, armed values, and peer group informal norms have a stronger influence on good conduct in battle than the threat of punishment. So military first-person shooters are an ideal setting in which to explore this influence. You know, within these games, the player typically assumes the role of an established hero or soon to become hero figure. And game designers should be clear um, regarding exactly what that kind of heroism should entail. It is rarely contingent, as one of the main characters in Modern Warfare suggests, on getting dirty. To the contrary, it's about staying clean no matter what degree of adversity. So heroes are those who maintain their humanity and honor despite the profound and at times seemingly overwhelming pressure in war to abandon both the restraint and honor. Military first-person shooters should make it clear, particularly to those who purport to show war as it truly is. But I think what's very important to stress here is that we are not advocating external censorship of these games. I mean, that would be in violation of freedom of expression, right? But what we're saying, and that's quite a modest goal, is to highlight the extent to which military first-person shooters, by downplaying or by denigrating the rules that exist, mislead Western audience as to the realities of war. 
And by integrating them more meaningfully, they would do a very, very good job to really live up to their promise to inject more authenticity and realism into their battlefield interactive gameplay. And players have shown, other research has shown, players have shown consistent willingness to embrace more complexity and more ambiguity in these gameplays. What players don't like is a sort of very clear, cut, easy path for them to go through, right? Instead, um, they are quite happy for ambiguity and so on. And so what we get with a lot of these games that have left out the, the laws of war, that have made violations of civilians possible, is that players themselves have criticized these games um, on account of their very poor integration of these kinds of complexities. So it is not here about first-person shooter militaries needing to choose between education and entertainment. If the education is done right, the entertainment invariably will follow. War is an institution bound by a set of imperfect but virtually and vitally important rules, rules that reduce the harm directed against the innocent and that help preserve the souls of those who fight. So realism ought to be a description reserved for those games that reflect this in both gameplay as well as in narrative. And I'll end on that point. Any questions or comments? Yeah. So at the end, um, Alvis, I want you to clarify for me what happens if we continue going through this war as hell. What, what's the outcome? What's the, what's the end game on that? Why is that important, that that myth not be <coughs> continued to be implanted into these games? So I go back to one of the starting points to say that we have these two interesting developments where on the one hand, Western militaries have really swung around a realization that they do need to do a better job integrating the laws of war in military training, in their military conduct, with all disclaimers included into this. All right? So like, if you look at how the British, the French, the German, the American military, the Australian military were looking at the laws of war up to and including the Second World War or Vietnam, and you look at what has happened subsequently, it's a watershed. Okay? So we have that development, a you know, clear statement, clear practice of further integrating the laws of war. Also in public statements, if you look at the rhetoric that you get from politicians and, and military leaders, it is framed in the just war tradition language, it's framed in the laws of war, right? All that sort of stuff. At the same time, we've got a second development, not development, of phenomenon, and that is that, that despite that first development, the war's helmet really has endured. It hasn't gone away. It's the exact opposite position, that none of those kinds of regulations, limits, on the const and constraints on the use of force should actually be taking place, right? And that goes from, you know, obviously the time of Vietnam all the way until recently. And so the question for us was, like, why is that, why is that not going away, right? What helps foster this? And that sort of was our launching pad into first-person shooter video games. Not to say that they're the sole and only reason for, for why this is happening, but in a way they help sustain it. And they help sustain it in, in a particular way that is quite unique to the nature, then the uniqueness comes due to the nature of first-person shooter video games. It's the immersive qualities that comes from the interaction that you have. It's different from you, you know, just leaning back on your couch and watching I don't know how a war unfolds somewhere over the news, right, or watching a movie, you are part of the plot, and that immersion is what researchers say gives first-person shooters a different quality. The more you interact and the more you repeat those interactions, the more it shapes and confirms belief systems. But does that affect what the military is trying to do? Is that, is that your fear, that ultimately that uh, trend that is in the No, 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 no. I, 
I think the, the end, well, the, I'm not sure that we are interested in what the problem is, not necessarily the end problem. The problem is that we have you know, a very, very popular medium for which people uh, experience interactively a particular reality of war that is not reflective of what it's really like, right? And that it is in the process of producing and sustaining that kind of war as hell argument, ultimately, right? There was, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question going back to. I have a question going back to the proximity of war. Are, is there any research or literature on what the proximity of war does, and not only what it does, but maybe what mediums, going to your overall point, but what mediums of proximity of war are more effective or ineffective, whatever those two words mean in this question? Okay, so the, prox the virtual proximity of war. Yeah, what is the yeah. meaning of proximity of war? Like, how, what, is, what is that relationship? Is there, is there a relationship? So, um, I mean, as a, you know, like the spectator sport argument from Michael Mann is a really good starting point, because I think he was ahead of his time. Right, you then got Michael Ignatieff writing a very powerful book on following the 1999 NATO military bombing campaign against uh, Serbia called Virtuous War. Right, which makes a similar argument, that Darian, sorry, virtual war, and then you've got the Darian with virtuous war. These are all people who look into this, and, and Christopher Coker has written some phenomenal stuff on this, but you know, like us getting out of the business of sacrifice in war as Western societies, the more we've become postmodern, means that we are no longer obliged to feel, experience war ourselves, right? So we don't have that with a few exceptions within our societies. But at the same time, war has encroached on us virtually through our screens, right? Up to a point where, and you can see this with like war reporting, right? And that has taken a bit of time. What was the first war, the first US war that became an instantaneously um, consumed war to audiences? Which one do you reckon? Vietnam. No. Vietnam was the first television war, but it took an average of one week of the footage from that war to reach the screens of Americans, and that was fast, right? What did you think? Was it World War II? No, 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 we need to go further in our direction here, yeah. It's Operation Iraqi Freedom. Operation Iraqi Freedom, right? Even the first Gulf War in the early 1990s was not that. 2003, the first time that it was instantaneous, right? It took an average of like four days from the first Gulf War for footage to appear on screens, right? That also had to do with not just technology, but censorship, obviously, right? But that gives us a sense, all of a sudden it becomes instantaneous, right? And not just, and this was on television, now it's on our phones, it's on our screens, it's everywhere, right? And it's become more multifaceted, right? It's no longer just coming from one source, let's say CNN, for example, right? So we've, we've, we're fully immersed in that, right? We get that footage kind of as it unfolds, right? ISIS became famous for launching its campaigns and then having live streams of it, and that played a particular function in them carving out the caliphate, right? So um, that's what I mean by um, virtual proximity, right? It makes it very easy for us to consume it, right? But we can consume it by sitting back and still having dinner at the same time. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we need the microphone. I believe this is a quote from MASH, but um, the quote is, uh, war is war, hell is hell, and war is certainly worse than hell. Um, you know, and, and lately I've uh, seen a lot of, uh, you know, kind of contemporary media and movies and film, uh, things like Band of Brothers, things like All Quiet on the Western Front, that um, I think are kind of highlighting some of these uh, treacheries that you're talking about. Um, why do you think it is that movies kind of at large are moving more towards um, embracing rules of international law um, and video games just are detached from that? It's a wonderful question. I don't have an answer to this, but I find it really puzzling 
And I'll give you one example that crystallizes this. So if you um, come this evening to the phenomenal screening, fun screening of Theaters of War, how the Pentagon and CIA took Hollywood, it's really about how for over 100 years, um, the Pentagon and then subsequently also the uh, CIA and, and others have been working very closely with uh, Hollywood filmmakers um, on films and about the kinds of influence that these offices, Pentagon and CIA entertainment li liaison offices have exerted on filmmaking. And this is all based on like over now um, something like 80,000 declassified documents that a colleague of mine and I have obtained through FOIA requests from those offices. So you can really trace that in terms of the influence that they have. And what is really, really interesting there is that any reference to, the, to violations of the laws of war by US soldiers needs to be changed by the filmmaker in order for them to continue collaborating on that particular production, okay? Um, and there's certain creativity. You can make the enemy make those violations of, of war, or you can actually have it uh, twist reality and then present it differently and, and, and so on. You've got various examples in that, in that documentary. So the, these offices call some of those kinds of things showstoppers. And violation of US forces violating the laws of war is an absolute showstopper, even if the historical record shows that this has been happening in reality, okay? So the military and the CIA are like really, really, really uh, careful not to have that appear on the film screen or on television. But it's the same militaries who have been collaborating with the production of first-person shooter video games. It's a very, very tight connection between US military armed forces and video game production. And so somehow, in that context, they're happy to go with the rules-free or anti-rule dimension, which I don't, it's been, when, when Neil and I were working on this, it's been like one of the questions that's been really bothering me, and we haven't pursued it. So I don't have an answer for that, but I find it really interesting. Yeah, sorry, we need to wait for the microphone. Uh, out of your two kind of categories you create between like the rules free and the anti rule, which one do you think is more like detrimental to this kind of mindset of yeah. like, yeah, yeah. like which one is plays a worse role in this kind of? I think it's the second one, the anti rule one, right? I mean, it's it's one thing to know that there are uh, rules and you can violate them, and there's you can violate them with impunity. Um, it's another one to kind of sell them as these are actual obstacles for you progressing in your mission and thereby you have to violate them. You know, this is like, re requires you an, an, an extra step in not just, okay, recognizing that they are there, but recognizing them as something that are hindering you. So I would come down on the entire rule very clearly. Great question. What do you think? Yeah. The first one seems far more like kind of it makes it almost not realistic. Like it creates kind of this like gun gunslaving kind of like this more artificial fictional version of war. Yeah. But when we put the rules in place, you make it feel realistic, but then also make distort it as a false reality of like okay, these are the rules, just work around them versus like you're just a character with like a minigun running around killing people. Like it's very one is far more like like at least for me, more you can distinct you can distinctly put that in the category of like this is a video game, not real. While the other one's like this is supposed to be realistic, mm. but it's telling me a false like narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm not sure who was first from the two gentlemen there, but. From a game design perspective, I can actually uh, provide a little bit of info on the um, perspective of why. Uh, kind of highlighting rules of warfare hasn't gone into game production as much. Part of it, in, from a perspective of simple rules-free games, is simply that it's a pain to code. Uh, successfully putting in protocols for enemies that are surrendering, uh, being able to put in pro protocols for following rules of war is simply a bother. So most game studios don't do that unless they're specifically out to highlight that but that doesn't take off very frequently because of the other problem, which that uh, game design is all about maximizing the state of flow for players and following rules of warfare is usually uh, 
usually that disrupts flow, so it's uh, not something that either the game developers or the audiences are necessarily interested in. When you get more into, so for from a design perspective, um, rule-free games are simply viewed as the default, and there's not a lot of interest in exploring active integration for them. And for games that come down on the sides of anti-rule, the games that come down on that, there's an unfortunate reality that quite a lot of the video game market is extremely reactionary and deliberately plays uh, for the purpose of um, doing transgressive activities and uh, living out essentially power fantasies of murder and breaking rules as part of the point. So when it comes down to it, the end result is that there's just not enough focus on games that can uh, focus on promoting rules of warfare well, there's a vast amount that simply doesn't focus on it that's too much effort, and then there's a sizable amount that deliberately breaks those rules in order to sell to the audience. So I can speak to why that's uh, the way it is. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And you know, it aligns with what I've read, and I'm, I'm, you know, it's not been like the core focus as to like what, why they haven't integrated so much, so I can totally sympathize from an understanding point of view with, with that. I would charge those, uh, those still that, you know, the big claim is always like it's more and more realistic and authentic, and that's the claim that you get from the producers, right? Yes. And so, yeah, 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 that's right. I mean, it's also like, as a starting point, very unrealistic that if you get shot, you just basically restart, right? So that's the first diversion from the reality of war. And of course, it's, it's about gaming, but also at the same time, you know, like all this interesting research on what gaming immersion does to people's belief systems and how you can, you know, through repetitive gameplay, you train people in particular ways, uh, generates particular beliefs, you know, that's a, that's a neat way to then start criticizing it, you know? Mm. Um, deliverance. Those simply aren't games that appeal to the vast majority of consumers. There's something that will always be. That's to to totally, and I, I can I can see that certainly one segment of those people who are attracted to these games probably are not attracted to them because they are looking for experience in the reality of conducting yourself in these fantasy or real or virtual battle spaces with the laws of war in mind. Um, but at the same time, uh, what most players like is complex games, right? That are, that are challenging rather than some sort of straightforward stuff. So here's also something that you could make part of the complexity that could make it more realistic in that sense. You had a question as well. Hello. Yep. Uh, do you think that modern social media, such as TikTok and Instagram, that provide access to war footage on separate platforms from conventional news media sources, uh, like for instance, was available in 2003 with the US invasion of Iraq, are lessening the impact of Western war propaganda that first person shooters and war movies have previously had in the past? For example, recent polling shows that young people who tend to play those video games um, and are, you know, usually who they're marketed for, hold far less favorable views of Western involvement in conflicts such as Gaza. Sorry, can you repeat the question there? There was a lot there, and my jet lag is starting to revolt against me, so. Do you, essentially, do you think that platforms such as like TikTok and Instagram that allow people to have, uh, whether it's live footage um, in potentially like an unvetted source and from varying perspectives that might just be a random civilian on the ground, uh, do you think that these different access points um, are also having an impact on, uh, you know, the potential impact that like first person shooters and war movies might have traditionally had, uh, you know, in the kind of pre-social media era um, do you think that they're lessening that impact? Whew, that's a great question. Um, I'm not so sure if, like, you know, which one has a bigger impact now, 
Um, I mean, they, they feed to, they feed different themes, right? That you wouldn't get a movie that is instantaneously giving an insight into the, just by the sheer production involved, right? But then you might go to the movies thinking, hey, this is, you know, the private movie industry giving me an insight into this. But uh, more often than not, when it comes to warm themed stuff, you would have informal military being part of the co-production of this, but it's not being declared, right? So there is a certain kind of militarized narrative that gets out there. That's the kind of mute music of our time. Um, social media is way more instantaneous in, in that sense, obviously. Um, and, and of course, it's a generational thing, right? If you look at like um, your, your generation, you know, is uh, definitely not subscribers to newspapers, right? Um, the news are not followed even by predominant news outlets anymore. It's usually through social media, um, through, you know, um, and so, and you've got the, the, the advantage of instantaneity. What is really striking at the same time is that there's so much interesting research on, on media consumption being done, is that, you know, yours or us here, we live in a world where we have more ability to actually gain an insight into any kind of political phenomenon or into war than any generation before us, right? We can have more multifaceted perspectives than any generation before us on a particular conflict, just by the nature of the global media sphere. The problem is we are overwhelmed by having these options. And so instead, and that's really interesting, instead of our media consumptions going broad, they have actually narrowed down. They have narrowed down so incredibly, and they have narrowed us down to a, a multitude that all confirm our pre-existing biases. That's the big story of the media research. So we have the ability, but we actually artificially narrow it down, right? Um, so which one gives us the better insight? Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to chat more about this. We have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Well, let's see, we had you before. Is there anyone else happy otherwise for you to come back in? All right, sure. So the, <clears throat> the military is, has its rules. But the military also uses language sometimes. For example, we all are against targeting of civilians. I think I don't think that's really a question. So you change the language there and you use collateral damage, for example. Um, all that is is philosophically, we weren't trying to, t to take out these civilians, but you know what? It's gonna, ha you know, it's gonna happen and get real. So we call it collateral damage, and we accept the, the loss of life on that because it just had to happen. So is that a rule that the, you know, can you change the rules by simply changing the description of what happens? More is happening than just changing the rhetoric. Um, so in, in the case of the US military, I've, I've published a book on saving soldiers and civilians. It looks at the uh, norms of casualty version and civilian protection in, in the history of US warfare. And you know, so I trace the evolution of civilian protection in the case of US warfare, for example. So I'll just focus on that here, right? So if you go to the earlier days of the United States military, there was a very clear understanding that you know, when they fought the Brits or fought other whites, that restraint would be used and prisoners of war status would be respected, right? But if they fought against indigenous populations, no rules applied whatsoever, right? You see this then extended to the way in which the US had conducted itself during um, wars between Asia where it was apes on khakis, as Japanese were described, right? Lots of racist undertones, Vietnam as well, versus at the same time, the conduct in the war in the, West, in, in the European theater, right? Japanese were incarcerated en masse, Germans never were in the United States, right? So a complete 
differentiation, with which the US also entered Vietnam and that backfired, right? Even though we need to remember that the big um, opposition to the Vietnam War was not coming from too many Vietnamese get killed, it was the concern over too many US forces, right? It's a bit of misreading of memorial history now. But what happens after Vietnam, first of all, is a realization that the laws of war weren't really taught to US soldiers. So that was integrated. The, the military was professionalized. But at the same time, we get a type of war with investment in technology that becomes more sophisticated, that allows for better discrimination, but also a conduct of war starting um, in the 1980s, but in particular with the first Gulf War and subsequently where casualty, uh, where both casualty aversion, not exposing US soldiers to risk, but also protection of civilians is really written into US military conduct. US ruled in 1999 in the Kosovo War to actually not bombard and target one of Milosevic's um, palaces, which would have been a legitimate target because a Rembrandt picture was hanging on the walls, okay? So you can see, and this is the extreme form, right? Where like, it's about not, it's not about civilians not getting killed. The laws of war are very clear on this. It's about not deliberately and directly targeting civilians. And that's the big change, right? The kind of strategic bombing rates that we've seen in the Second World War, the carpet bombing in Vietnam, it's inconceivable today, right? Yes, violations occur. Yes, too many civilians still get killed indirectly and unintentionally, right? Also because these sophisticated weapons raise ambitions of what it is that you might want to do, right? But it's a significant sea change there, right? Not, at, and so the, not only the rhetoric has changed, but the rhetoric and the practice have changed. They're not always in sync, you know, when Rumsfeld was saying the most restrained military campaign ever conducted in human history when he comes to Afghanistan, for example. Well, that's, that's contentious, but you know, it's a sea change from how it was done 20, 40, 60 years ago. So we are out of time, so everyone please join me in uh, thanking our guest. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>